Hello everyone, uh, this is a recording for week two of Philosophy 1A. Uh, I'm just going to go briefly over the material that we covered on Monday uh, and prepare you a little bit for the test on the Thursday. So on Monday we talked about uh, the difference between a valid argument and a sound argument uh, and what is necessary for an argument to be valid and what's necessary for an argument to be sound. Um, we then moved on to talk about uh, Descartes' dreaming argument um, and his external world scepticism. Um, in the test, you're going to be tested on both of these things, uh, as well as um, a little bit of stuff on um, Hilary Putnam's Brain in a Vat, uh, and later on uh, the Hume problem of induction that we're going to cover in the lecture on the Thursday. But let's look back at uh, valid and sound arguments. So an argument is valid if the conclusion follows from the premises. Um, it's as simple as that, really. So, suppose we have an argument of this structure. Uh, first, all bachelors are unmarried men. Second, uh, I am a bachelor. Uh, and then you'll find that it follows from those two premises that uh, I am uh, a man, because all bachelors are unmarried men. Um, if the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, then the argument is invalid. So, suppose I were to say, uh, all bachelors are unmarried men, I am a swan, uh, therefore I am a bachelor, uh, doesn't follow at all, does it? Um, the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises, and so the argument is invalid. Even if we were to say three correct statements, so uh, for example, mm, the world is round, um, uh, my table is wood, uh, therefore my name is Ben, three true statements, uh, but the argument is nonetheless invalid because the conclusion doesn't follow from the premises. For an argument to be sound, it has to be valid, that is, the conclusion has to follow from the premises, but it also has to be the case that the premises are true. If the premises are true uh, and uh, the argument is valid, then we know that the conclusion is true. It's just true by definition. In a philosophy, uh, we tend to either be putting forward our own uh, conclusion and then trying to provide a sound argument uh, to support that conclusion, or we tend to be looking at other people's arguments and trying to show that those arguments uh, are in some sense fallacious. Uh, to prove that an argument is fallacious, all we have to do is show either that one of the premises is false or that the argument is invalid. Okay, so if you know all that, you'll be fine uh, on the valid and sound questions in the test. Then we moved on to Descartes' reading argument. Descartes argued that uh, Sometimes we could have dreams that are so vivid that they were indistinguishable from real life experiences. Um, and given that uh, sometimes you could have dreams that were this vivid, uh, it was impossible, it's impossible to tell whether right now uh, you're in a dream or not. They are qualitatively, qualitatively identical experiences. Is this a good argument? Well, some have argued uh, that it's not because uh, were, uh, if one is to say that uh, the experience of uh, dreaming um, can be qualitatively identical to uh, the experience of real life, uh, one must be able to take the two and compare them. Um, but of course, if they're qualitatively identical, um, then you can't tell the difference between the two, and so uh, those two premises are incompatible. Um, it's therefore a self-defeating argument, uh, at least that's the claim. Something similar is going on uh, with Hilary Putnam's uh, brain in a bat situation. That is to say, he wants to set up a situation whereby uh, we think we're living an everyday uh, normal life with a real external world where I come to university and it's a real university and I teach you students and you're real students. But really it's just a, a, a made up world, a, a sort of dream world, a bit like uh, in the Matrix. Um, his idea is that uh, we're, we're literally, in reality, uh, just brains uh, in a vat full of nutrients with electrodes uh, put to our head by an evil scientist who's feeding us all these electrical signals that uh, make us feel as though we're in this real world. A bit like the Matrix film. Now, Putnam believes uh, that something called semantic externalism is true. 
right? Um, semantic externalism is the uh, thesis that the meaning of a word gets uh, a, a word gets its meaning from something external to the person uttering it. So I'm ut uh, uttering the word water, um, but the meaning of the word water comes from the substance that I'm referring to. In, in this particular case, when I refer to water, I refer to the chemical compound uh, hydrogen dioxide, H2O. But um, Putnam um, suggests that uh, there could be uh, a twin, hypothetically I could have a twin on another planet uh, in which water, or the, at least the uh, substance that is qualitatively identical to water, that is it's clear, uh, it, it freezes at zero degrees centigrade, um, I can drink it and, and so on. Uh, that stuff, that water um, for my twin might have the chemical compound XYZ. So for my twin, twin Ben, uh, when he says this is water, w water means XYZ and not H2O. Putnam supposes, um, suppose I, uh, having lived on Earth where water is uh, H2O, and when I point at the glass of, of the clear liquid, say, that's a glass of water, uh, and I say something true because I mean H2O. Suppose I travel to Twin Earth, uh, where the clear liquid that you can drink is, is that actually has the chemical compound XYZ. And when I get there and I say, that is water, uh, I'm actually saying something false, because although it's clear and, and uh, drinkable and, and so on, um, when I say water, I mean H2O. But this isn't H2O, this is XYZ. Uh, and so when I say um, I'm going to have a glass of, uh, or this is a glass of water, I'm saying something false. Now, this semantic externalism forms a basis of his uh, objection to um, the, the brain and a vat um, situation. I mean, the question he asks is, look, if I am a brain in a vat, I will be able to say um, I'm a brain in a vat and say it truthfully. Uh, but using his semantic externalism, he tries to prove that you cannot truthfully utter I'm a brain in a vat. So how does he go about this? Well, he says that uh, if you're not a brain in a vat and you say I am a brain in a vat, then the meaning of the word brain and the meaning of the word vat comes from um, the actual external world. So, you know, brain means, you know, brain, this actual physical thing in the head. And that means, uh, you know, the actual physical vat. So when I say uh, I'm a brain in a vat, I'm saying that I am this physical brain, real brain in a real vat. Um, and of course it's false because uh, I'm not a brain in a vat, right? So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm me, I'm lecturing, uh, I'm, I'm recording this video and so on. But if you are a brain in a vat, says Putnam, the meaning of the word brain isn't really brain as a kind of physical, real, external world brain. What we, what we mean by brain is in fact a sort of brain in a vat brain, a dream brain, a not, a, not a real brain, a dream brain. Uh, and similarly with vat, uh, when I say vat, if I'm actually uh, a brain in a vat and the evil scientist is just showing me pictures of vats, when I say vat, I, I really mean dream vat. That's the meaning of the word vat. It's a, it's a dream vat, a brain in a vat vat. So uh, when I actually utter I'm a brain in a vat, if I am a brain in a vat, that is to say if uh, in the real world per se there's a uh, physical brain and a vat full of nutrients and the evil scientist is putting all these, uh, all, this, all these thoughts into my head. When I say I'm a brain in a vat, what I mean is I am a, a dream brain uh, in a dream vat or I'm a brain in a vat brain in a brain in a vat vat. And of course that's false because even if I am a brain in a vat, I'm not a brain in a vat vat uh, well, I'm not in a, a, a brain in a vat brain in a brain in a vat vat or a dream brain in a dream vat, right? I'm just uh, me living my normal life in my normal world. It's just that my normal world is a, it's a dream world. So in that situation, I can't truthfully utter I'm a brain in a vat either. Okay, 
So that's the Putnam situation. So moving on to Hume. David Hume um, was a Scottish empiricist. And the empiricists tend to think that you can only justifiably believe things that you can see, experience. Because he was an empiricist, uh, he was a skeptic about all sorts of things. Um, he thought that you couldn't know the nature of uh, the true nature of God, uh, and he thought uh, that you couldn't observe necessary connections between distinct existences. I'll say a little bit more about that in the lecture on Thursday. But also. He was very famous for um, outlining this major problem um, called the problem of induction. And it's a, a particularly big problem because many of our beliefs are held through inductive reasoning. Okay, so inductive reasoning uh, is, well, let's just give examples. So suppose I uh, see the sunrise every morning. I see the sunrise every morning and I think, Okay, well, the sun's risen every morning, so it's going to rise tomorrow. And sure enough, it rises tomorrow. I see um, gravity. I get, out of, I get out of bed every morning and I stick to the floor. Okay. Uh, it stands to reason that tomorrow when I get out of bed, I'm, I'm going to stick to the floor because, you know, gravity holds. It's a law of nature. But it's not logically impossible for gravity not to hold tomorrow. It's not logically impossible that the sun doesn't arise, doesn't rise tomorrow morning, in exactly the same way as, uh, you know, it's not logically. Suppose I, I'm I'm um, in a casino and I spin the wheel and it and it lands on red and then I spin it again and it lands on red and I spin it again and I land on red, and and I'm using this roulette wheel and it lands red, 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 and if it's a fair roulette wheel and there's you know roughly half red and half black. It's always possible for it just to land black. Just because it's landed red every time previously doesn't mean um, that it's going to land red next time. It's certainly logically possible that it's going to land black. In fact, if it's a fair roulette wheel, it's you know roughly 50-50. It might well land black. And in terms of the logic of, of um, you know the sun rising and these inductive inferences where we just observe something over and over again and assume that it's going to happen again, it's no different to the roulette example. We've seen it plenty of times in the past. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen tomorrow. Now, of course, one might argue that, oh, well, it's a law of nature. You know, physics tells us that the sun's going to rise. But I mean, you know, what's to say that this law of nature is not going to break down tomorrow? You know, uh, the laws of nature held yesterday, they held the day before, they held the day before that. Um, but that, just like the roulette, doesn't necessarily mean the laws of nature are going to hold tomorrow. At least there's no uh, logical necessity involved in that. So how might one try and justify this? Well, you might think, well, inductive inferences work. Indu inductive inferences of this kind, they work. If something has happened again and again and again and again and again in the past, we're justified in believing that it's going to happen in the future. Or we might say, well, what justifies us in thinking that, that uh, inductive reasoning is a good way of reaching conclusions is that inductive reasoning has worked many times in the past. So inductive reasoning worked uh, with the gravity example. Inductive reasoning worked with the sun rising example. Inductive reasoning worked uh, oh, all sorts of things. I mean, it, I mean, it might be something so simple as a, a really good football team winning all the time. You know, it, it stands to reason that uh, the best football team in the world will beat uh, a very poor football team because they've beaten that poor football team every time in the past. You know, inductive reasoning seems to be a very, very reliable strategy. Not infallible, but very reliable. So you might say, well, we're justified in believing the conclusions of inductive arguments because inductive arguments, well, they... they They've worked in the past. They have continued to work in the past. But there's a problem with that because that form of reasoning, the form of reasoning that, well, the last inductive argument I used worked, the, the argument before that, the last the, the inductive argument before that worked, uh, worked, so we should believe that inductive arguments in the future are going to work. That in itself is an uninductive argument. So you've tried to uh, justify induction um, by using induction. And obviously, uh, this is circular. 
So that response, the uh, you can justify induction inductively, doesn't seem uh, too successful. I'll talk about that more in the lecture. Uh, there are responses, um, but that's the general gist. Uh, okay, so uh, that's all I'll, I'll say for the time being. Um, make sure that you uh, arrive at 9.40 on time because I'm really going to have to get going um, early with the lecture tomorrow. Um, and uh, I'll go over in a bit more detail the Putnam stuff again, make sure everyone understands that because there was a bit of difficulty. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to seeing you tomorrow.